Turn to someone around you. I know Matthew already said to do it, but I want to say it again. Turn to someone around you and say, Merry Christmas again. Okay? Not the again part, just the Merry Christmas. I apologize for the way that my voice sounds. I have that beautiful Blake Shelton, Josh Turner, Gaither vocal band, uh, deep tenor going on right now. Um, I'm dealing with a little bit of a cold, so you can excuse me if I have to sneeze or anything like that. I will try not to blow the speakers out when I sneeze or, or anything like that. So anyways, if you do not know me, my name is Nathan. I am the Connection and College Pastor here, and I have the honor of teaching one of these Advent series that we are uh, in, this Advent series that we're in, just Advent at Hope, as we are working on reflecting, reminding, and restoring the wonder of this story, season, and just of our faith as well. We're going to be touching on four different things throughout these teaching times. Last week, Pastor Mark talked about the wait, this idea that comes from when the last prophet speaks, and then that 400-year period where there's a, 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 a silence, and it seems like God is not working, and yet he talked through the the genealogy of Matthew about how God works even when it doesn't look like he's working and that we are to be actively waiting when we don't necessarily know what to do. Uh, then today I get the privilege of talking about this idea of the word, God made flesh and dwelling among us from John 1, 1 through 18. If you want to go ahead and turn there now in your Bibles. Next week, Pastor Mark will talk about the worship and then we end Christmas Eve on that 6.30 New, uh, Christmas Eve service uh, talking about the wonder. And so it's this exciting series that we're really just excited to be teaching through. But today I want to start off talking about the word with a question. Okay, and first service had a little bit of struggle with this, but you guys can yell out your answers to me. Okay, I'm giving you permission to yell out your answer to me when I ask you this question. So here's the question. When I say the Christmas story, what do you think of? Yell out some answers, please. Shoot you out. I knew someone was, we are in church. Okay, I was worried that somebody was going to talk about the movie Christmas story and talk about leg lamps and a BB gun, but that, okay, we're in church. So let's talk about the church Christmas story. What do you think of? Go. Mary, manger. Thank you, Trinity. Uh, Anyone else? Wise men. Come on, Cass. Baby Jesus, six pound, five ounce, baby Jesus, lion and manger, absolutely. That is all the things that we think of when we think of the Christmas story. This is the normal Christmas story that we're used to, story that we've potentially heard hundreds, if not thousands of times in our life. If you're unfamiliar with the story, let me give you the most condensed version of this story possible, and that is that there was a young woman named Mary. She was betrothed to Joseph, that means she was going to marry him. And she was a virgin, and one night an angel visits her and tells her that she's going to have a baby. This is a problematic situation that she's pregnant at this point because she is a virgin. But that this baby is not just any ordinary baby, but this is in fact the savior of the world. Long story short, there's some unrest in the land that her and Joseph are living in. So they flee to this place called Bethlehem. They find a place to have a baby in a stable, a grimy place where animals were kept. And they put him in a manger once she has him, and there's a star above him, and it lead shepherds and wise men to him. This is the most condensed Christmas story. I encourage you to go read it in Matthew and Luke if you're unfamiliar with it. But this is the Christmas story. There's so much beauty and truth wrapped up in this Christmas story. And yet the story that we are in today, the story that we're in today is not necessarily your normal average Christmas story. John 1, 1 through 18, John decides to focus on the Christmas story, yes, but not what was physically happening at the time when Jesus was born, but John focuses on what was occurring in the spiritual realm at the time of Jesus' birth. So this is a different kind of Christmas story this morning, and so I'm excited to to teach through it with you all, Uh, but before we jump in, would you all just take a moment to pray with me and also pray for me as I uh, attempt to preach and teach the word. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much just for this opportunity that we have to come to you, worship you, kneel before your throne, God, and just proclaim who you are, proclaim how you are full of wonder and you provide this sense of awe and brilliance in our life just because of the glory that you have put on display through your son, Jesus. God, I pray that today we see you clearer. God, I pray that we get discernment in our life and things and decisions that we're trying to make through just teaching through this word, God. I pray that it is not my voice that is speaking today, God, but it is truly the Holy Spirit speaking into the lives of every single one of us in this room today. God, we thank you, and it's in your name we pray. And every single person said, amen. Awesome. All right, if you haven't already, turn to John 1, 1 through 18, and if you've had it open, you're going to notice that there is a obvious word that is used there multiple times throughout these 18 verses that we have not yet seen used in this context. John uses the word 
the word uh, to describe a title of Jesus. And he uses this title of Jesus very specifically. And so before we even jump into this text, it's important for us to unpack what this word that he uses as a title of Jesus means, because while the Greek to English translation is the word or the word of God, it holds much deeper and broader and more complex implications than just being the word of God. So what we start off with today is the Greek word for the word, which is logos. Everyone say logos. Excellent. Lagos. Yes, sure. Uh, that's a different, whatever, Trinity. You did a great job. Anyways, you guys are now a Greek aficionado, so congratulations. But this word, as we see, holds a lot of rich context in the way he would have used it. You see, when he uses the word lagos, it's a really a beautiful word that he uses because the Greek and Gentile people would have understood exactly what he meant at that time because it's in their language. But the beauty of him using this word is that actually it holds a lot of a sacredness and speciality in to the Jewish people, that the Jewish people would have understood what he meant when he says logos, the word of God. Because the word of God was the way in which the Jewish people knew God by him revealing himself to them. The word of God was the way in which they experienced him and knew him. And so the word of God is this sacred thing to them. We see God entrust the word of God to the Israelites in the book of Exodus when Moses receives the Torah, the law, the the 10 commandments that then is all of these other things. And this law is sacred to them because they center their whole lives around it as God is showing them out of his love for them how to be holy just as he is holy. If you go to a modern day synagogue, you're actually gonna see during a Shabbat Shalom service that they spend over three hours reading these Old Testament passages from the Torah and other scriptures because the word of God, the word Lagos that he uses here is sacred to the Jewish people. But what John does here is he uses this word as the title for Jesus. He doesn't use any other title that we're used to, like Jesus or Lord, Messiah, Son of God. The list could go on on and on. And the reason is because John is helping us to see the original intention and function of Christ towards creation as the word. When John uses that word lagos, he is helping us to see what he, what God, or how God is going to function in this world. Early philosophers and theologians help us to unpack the original intention and function behind this word logos to Heraclitus, fancy name, someone name your kid that please. Um, Heraclitus says, the word is the omnipresent wisdom by which all things are steered. Philo of Alexandria says that the word is the agent of creation. And other theologians and philosophers have described it, and this one's found in your notes, as the means by which man may know God the means by which man may know God. It's not very different than how the Jewish people thought of the word of God. It's God revealing himself to his people. And so when we find that John is using it here and we take all of these descriptions and definitions of the word logos, we see that the reason John uses this title for Jesus specifically is because he was revealing Jesus to be the one who is both bringing God's word to the people, a new revelation of the word of God, but that he himself is also the full revelation of God manifested in the flesh. He is both bringing the word and he himself is also the word. C.H. Dodd clarifies this complex thought by kind of saying, as Jesus gives life and is also life, as he gives bread and is also bread, as he speaks truth and is also truth, so as he speaks the word, he is also the word. This is the word that we find here in John 1.1, that that this is the God that we find in the Christmas story. This is the baby that we see lying in the manger, the word of God. And John 1, 1 through 18 kind of reveals everything that this word has come to do. We start in John 1, verse 1. He writes, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In the beginning was the word. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John here is showing that the word that is the revelation of God here in the flesh has been with God for all of eternity, but also that he is God. Look again in verse one, John writes, in the beginning was the word. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Third hand up if that sounds familiar to you, in the beginning. Excellent, awesome. If it does, congratulations. If not, no worries. Just flip to Genesis one where we are gonna see that the author of Genesis starts off with the same three words as he declares the, the creative narrative. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then he goes and he expounds all of these things that God creates over this span of seven days, whether that's literal or figurative, I'm not here to debate that. That's just the creation narrative. 
And John here is specifically using those same three words in the beginning because he is alluding to that Genesis 1 passage. And he's alluding to it not because he wants us to remember the beginning of creation. He's alluding to it because he wants us to remember what existed when creation came into being. That the word was with God. It is the claim that John makes that Jesus has been with God from the beginning. He shows this by actually saying in verse 3, all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. He's showing that the proof for the fact that the word has existed with God is that all creation has been made through him. So without the word, if the word doesn't exist with God eternally, then creation could never take place because the word of God is the voice in which God speaks to both create and reveal. The word is the voice of God in which God speaks to make the heavens and the earth in a just a snap of a moment, he, he speaks and, and creation comes. He is the voice in which reveals himself to his people like the Israelites. So when we see in the Old Testament God speaking to the Israelites, it is the word of God speaking to the Israelites. The word has been with God from the beginning. But the word with God is not enough for us today. If we leave out the fact that the word is also God, we run the risk of worshiping two or three gods. We run the risk of having a, a head honcho daddy God, and I promise to never say daddy in a sermon, but I just did. But we have this head honcho Greek type of God that then has all of these sub little guys that are running around doing his bidding and his work. Or we run the risk of thinking that Jesus is just some sort of angelic being. But the reality that John says, and the fundamental truth that John reveals here, is that God exists as a trinity. That God exists three in one and one in three. And I know whenever we start talking about the Trinity, people get sweaty palms or we start to check out because we think it's boring. But the Trinity is one of the most fundamental truths of our Christian faith today. The Trinity is one of the most important things for, under, for us to understand about this Christmas story. It's what helps to restore the wonder of this story. And because I love each of you, I provided a graphic for us today. Amen. Hallelujah, right? So anyways... I believe that this graphic is a really helpful tool in us understanding, not perfectly, but kind of understanding how, ex how God exists as three persons in one and one God in three persons. We see that the Father is God, the Spirit is God, the Son is God, that Son is also the Word of God, and yet the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not God, and yet they are all God. It's kind of confusing, I get it, but this is the mystery that has been revealed to us both in this word right here and also the word being Jesus, Jesus Christ himself when he dwells within our hearts. And the beauty is that this trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, each exist in holy, perfect fellowship with one another as one God. So you may be thinking, Nathan, why in the world are we talking about Trinitarian doctrine during a Christmas story? And one, I talk about the Trinitarian doctrine because the Bible does. And we can't just pick and choose things in the Bible to leave out or to, to include. We can't just preach on certain things and leave out other things just because they're a little challenging to teach on. What we have to do is we have to dive into the challenging texts that talk about the doctrine of Trinity or the doctrine of hell in our individual faith. There are going to be things that are hard to take in, understand, and digest. But we run the risk if we avoid those things by creating a weak and wobbly faith that does not stand the test of time. If we just get some sort of pseudo-therapy from the Bible and that's all we're getting and we're not seeing the living God presented to us here so that we can live by him and follow him more, then we're not really doing and following and being sanctified as he intended us to be. So we, one, talk about the Trinity because the Bible talks about it. But two, we talk about the Trinity because it is only because God exists three in one and one in three that God knows and has the kind of love to step into our life for our sake. Hear that today, this fellowship, because he is with God and also is God, that union, that communion, that friendship and relationship that's perfect and holy is the very reason in which God knows love and the reason why the New Testament author says God is love. He is love because he exists as a trinity. He has a heart for us because he exists as the trinity. And third, we talk about the trinity because when we realize that the Son is God, the Father is God, the Spirit is God, but they are not each other, then what we realize is that that baby lying in a manger at six pounds, five ounces, laying in a manger, that God, that baby is God himself. 
He's not some sort of lesser deity. He's not an angelic being being manifested. He's not an agent of God or an angel of God sent to do his will. He is the manifestation of the glory of God in the flesh, both fully man and fully God. D. Blair Smith says that he becomes everything we are without ceasing to be everything that he is. This is the word that John is describing here in 1, 1 through 3, and he lays it out for all of those reasons that I said. And the word is with God, and the word was God, and God sends his word to this world to do what he has always done, and that is to reveal a way in which we can experience and know that triune God. It's the function of the word in the world as John transitions from these first three verses into the next four through 13 verses as we're gonna skip around, but just you'll be able to see where I'm, I'm reading from. But he transitions us from this idea that the word has existed as God eternally to the fact that this word functions as a light or the light that reveals eternity. It's where we pick back up in the Christmas story in verses four and five when he writes, in him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The first thing that John says that the light has come to do is in his work to reveal eternity to God's people is that he has come to extinguish, expel, and shine light on the darkness. The reason that God has to step into our life, the reason that we have this Christmas story and the death and the resurrection is because there's this thing called sin that exists when humanity fell. That sin came into this world and what sin does is it blinds us and covers us in darkness. It does not overcome us, as he writes, but it covers us in darkness so that we are blind to see that there even is a God. We're blind to see that there's even a pathway to God. We're blind to how we can be holy as how, how he is holy. This is the symptom of sin. Romans 1.21 explains our condition by saying, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Ephesians 4.18 says, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Our human condition is that we are covered in darkness, fools trying to find our way to God, not even sometimes recognizing that there is a God, not living our life as if there is a God because of the darkness that is around us. What we need is a light. And I want to take a moment then to pause and talk about one of the hardest parts of Cassie's in my marriage so far when we're talking about the idea of this darkness and this light. Let me take a quick sip. And that is going to the bathroom in the dark. Okay, I know you guys were probably expecting something way more serious, but this is serious to me. So hang on and this will apply, I promise. Okay, before you're married, right, when you had to go to the bathroom in the dark, you can just flip on the lights, walk to the bathroom, turn on the bathroom light, not worry about how loud the fan is and it's gonna wake up someone else. You can just do what you need to do, get back to bed and it's just like that. But when you get married, you now have to care for someone else and think about someone else. Now I do have a friend who just flips on all the lights and he does not care that he's waking up anyone or anything because he says he's gotta go. But for me, the person that I married, when she is asleep, she is asleep, right? Like you do not want to wake her up when she is sleeping. The only things that can wake her up are her alarm and God himself. Those are the only two things that are allowed to wake her up. If you wake her up in the middle of the night, it would be like standing behind a horse and smacking it as hard as you can you're going to get kicked across the room. Okay, that's just what happens if you wake her up. And so what I have to do is I have to go to the bathroom in the dark. And there are a lot of obstacles. The first is there's my dog that likes to lay right beside me because she's cute and she loves me. But I can't tell if she's there or not sometimes. So when I wake up and I have to go to the bathroom, I kind of just, you know, reach my foot over and I'm just like trying to feel gently for her because I'm trying to figure out where she is. And no matter how light I touch her, she is going to react as if the ceiling is coming down on her, right? She's going to jump up, jump back, and sometimes give a yelp. But the funny thing is that our dog also knows not to wake up Cassie. So both of us just instantly freeze. And my dog's sitting there going, I don't know if my dog can pray. That's a whole other conversation. But if the dog could pray, she would be praying in that moment just like me. We wait for Cassie kind of like adjust, and she rolls back over and keeps sleeping. And I keep on my journey and my dog goes back to sleep. And my next obstacle are the things that are laying on the floor. Now we're not messy people, but 
there's just some things that lay on the floor. And I don't know if you're like me, but whether something is five inches away or 10 feet away, my foot will find a way to just kick that thing as hard as possible. And whether you are the most machoist man or woman or the weakest person in the world, stubbing your toe, I dare say, is top five in the pain scale because I, yeah, it just feels like a hammer is coming down your toe. So that's my second obstacle, all these things. And then when you do stub your toe, she's asleep. And we live in an old home, so if I start going like this, you know what you normally do to get rid of that pain, our whole house starts shaking, right? And so we are worried about the foundation and all that stuff, but that's a whole different conversation. And then our final obstacle, and that is normally when you get to the bathroom, you can close the door and then flip on the light. The problem is our bathroom doesn't have any doors on it right now. So I'm just going to the bathroom completely in the dark, and I'm having to make sure that everything that needs to be where it needs to be is where it gets to be, if you catch the drift. And so what I need in the midst of all of this is the same thing that we need in this world, told you I'd bring it back, is a light. As I was uh, actually asking Pastor Mark's permission to share this story uh, earlier this week, he actually recommended a toilet bowl halo light uh, for the bowl. I didn't know this existed, but it is now on my Christmas wish list, absolutely, amen and hallelujah for that. And it's the same thing. We're walking in darkness with these obstacles around us. We don't see what we're aiming at, metaphorically speaking. We don't see what we're aiming at or anything like that. And what we need is a light, not a toilet bowl halo light, something a little bit more powerful than that. I think of the Psalms when he says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, revealing the ways and the steps in which you are taking. Christ is this word manifested in the flesh. So if we are following him, if we are striving to be like him, if we are living by the spirit, he is a lamp unto our feet. It's this beautiful thing that he functions as a light that reveals the steps in which we are to be taking. But he also, as this light functions as a second thing, because this light is no longer just shining for one people, this light is shining for all to see. It's where you pick back up in verses 9 through 13, and we're going to skip a couple, so just hang with me. But it says, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That this word has come as a light to shine, not just for a specific people, but for all to see. But the problem for me that I find is that this text kind of shows that he says he came to his own and his own people rejected him, and then he went to the world. So my question is the same as probably when Paul writes in Romans 1, verse 16, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's a common theme we find throughout the New Testament that it is this message for all who receive it, and yet he comes first for the Jew and then the Gentile. So what, is, is John and these New Testament authors, are they saying that, God came only for the Jewish people, but when, then, when they rejected him, he looked around and he said, well, who else we got, right? Who else can I help and, and save, right? Last week, if you haven't listened to it, please go listen to Pastor Mark's message as it kind of reveals a lot more about this idea that we're talking about right now. But we saw that the Gentile people were never an afterthought to God. God always intended to come to the world. And so what we see here is actually a really beautiful aspect of John's Christmas story that helps us to do what we're trying to do in the season. And that is to restore this wonder of what God did in the birth of Jesus Christ. That there's this truth that while there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but we are all one in Christ Jesus, God chose to honor his chosen people by coming to them first while simultaneously coming for the world. It's a small little tidbit of this story that is not just some little geeky nerd out moment, but it's something that adds so much value, truth, and wonder to this story. In Genesis 15, there's something called the Abrahamic covenant that is made where where God actually upholds both ends of the covenant, promising that Abraham's offspring will number more than the stars and that he is going to be their God and them his people. And we see time and time again, God uphold this covenant agreement on both ends when the Israelites are rejecting them and saying that this dude, this God doesn't care about us. He's never here for us when he's the one who parted the seas and he's the one who hit a staff on a rock and water spewed out and all these crazy things that, that they have witnessed time and time again, the Israelites reject God and yet God, because he's made this covenant and established this, what we call the old covenant, he upholds it and he continues to be their people and them his. 
And the beauty of this is that when it comes time for him to come into this world and make a way for all believers, when he's about to set up a new covenant that would include this people in it, he doesn't just forget about them and say, well, you're included in this, so you'll get it. He actually honors them by coming through them and to them. God establishes this new covenant through the line of the old covenant. It's this beautiful little tidbit of this story. God comes to earth as the word from Abraham's line. In genealogy of Matthew, as we touched on and, and looked through last week, we see that while it is an imperfect line to Jewish standard, it is still saying that Jesus is born into a Jewish family as a Jewish man. And for this, and for the Jewish people, this is a high honor to have the savior of the world come through them. It's God fulfilling one prophecy while creating another for the whole world that includes them as well. He did not have to do it this way. God is all powerful. He could have chosen what he wanted to do and yet he chose to come this way because he knew, cared for, and honored his chosen people. He cares and is involved in the most small details and corners of our life. It's this beautiful truth that we see that he's not just some massive God that's just bulldozing his way through each of our lives, using us as pawns or pieces. He's not just some clockmaker who sets it, makes sure the massive things are gonna work and then he lets everything else run smoothly. No, he is working and is intimately involved in every single aspect of our life. He's involved in the big things of our life, like God, who should I marry and what God should I, or what job should I take and where should I settle down? And he's involved in the small moments of our life, like God, where are my keys? God, please don't give me food poisoning because that chicken was super suspect from, from, well, I've gotten food poisoning from Applebee's twice, so I refuse to go there ever again, but that's a different story. He cares about the small and he cares about the big and everything in between. He cares because he has chosen and come for you. God is not a small God to where he would get offended if you bother him with these things because he's too busy. God is out of time. God has time for every single aspect. He wants you to invite him into every single aspect of your life and your soul. So never think that you can't bother God with something because it's too small. God wants all of it because he has made a way for you to be his children. My uh, nephews, one of them is, is five, and he seems to think that I, I guess I am his, I don't, he just seems to think that every single thing is worth sharing. I don't know if you know toddlers or have them, but he'll come up to me and he'll just start sharing every single tidbit of his detail. And for me, because I'm an imperfect human, I'm looking at my watch like, when is he going to stop talking? Because I don't even understand what he's saying really right now. But he goes to his mom or his dad and they're sitting there going like this. Oh, really? Tell me more about that. Tell me more about Jimmy from preschool that you played with today that I've never met. And I don't think there's a Jimmy in your preschool class, but that's okay. Tell me about it. Tell me about the bug that you just found and I think it's in your brother's pocket or something, right? There, there's all these things that he shares and if it's with me, I don't care about it, but if it's with his dad or his mom, they're soaking it up. This is our heavenly father. He soaks every aspect when we want to share something with him, when we go to him in prayer, whether it's car keys or grief and depression and anxiety, he cares. And it's revealed in the fact that God made a way for the whole world, still upholding that covenant that he made with them, but he decided to go the extra mile for these chosen people that he chose thousands of years prior by coming through them and to them first. Don't get this twisted. None of this means that the Jewish people are held higher than the Gentile, that they have special pasts or priority in the way in which they are deemed righteous or that they are saved. Every single one of us, Jew, Gentile, everyone is going to experience, if they believe in Jesus Christ, the covenant blessing that is eternal life with him in a relationship with him. When John writes that we have the right to become children of God through belief in him, it is this new covenant that is established to him. So now for the Jew and the Gentile, for you and for me, it's no longer what family you're born into. This salvation cannot be handed down from generation to generation. It's not by the will of man or the will of flesh. You cannot earn this salvation. You cannot work your way towards this salvation. It is only by God and through God in belief in Jesus that you are deemed and made his child. It is the new covenant that he has made. It is the work of the word in the world as he sheds light on a new path and gives life, just as a light would give life to plants and other things to all who believe in him. And the way that he chooses to function as the light, this word chooses to function as the light in this world, 
is by becoming flesh. It's verse 14 where we pick back up and where we end today. He writes, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Verse, verse 16, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. In these last four verses of the Christmas story that are truly the fulcrum of this passage and of John's Christmas story, we get to see that what was happening during the time that Mary was holding her baby and the animals and the wise men and the shepherds were knelt, bowed down, celebrating that there was something happening in the spiritual realm that had Satan trembling and creation worshiping. The word that is the light of the world was stepping into this world as flesh. The king was here. The God of the universe had come to destroy all sin and darkness and evil forever. This is the wonder of the story. We've talked a lot about how the word is God. The word was with God. We've talked about how the word functions as this light in the world. And he chooses to function as this light in the world. And he chooses to establish this new covenant. And he chooses to be our savior by becoming that which he is not. And that is flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he does this because there, a new way is needed for us. See, before God steps into the world, the way in which he reveals himself, the people that he reveals himself to, all of these things are drastically different as we've kind of already touched on. And it was because this was a God who was so full of glory and brilliance and sheer holiness that no man could ever look upon him and live. To look upon God would have meant death. To see the fullness of God's glory on display would have been death. It's a story that I mentioned really early on in this sermon, but it's one that we're going to come back to here in Exodus 33, 18 through 23. And it's a story where of, of Moses who's up on the mountain and God is revealing himself through the Torah. It is this law that he have. It's, it's, it's God entrusting his word to the Jewish people, to his chosen people. But the way in which he does so is by letting Moses have a glance at him. Let's read in verse 18. It says, Moses said, please show me your glory. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, which is the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock and my glory passes by. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. To look upon God would mean death. It's why they had a tabernacle. It's why they had a, a, temp, a temple. It's why they, that God was separate from us because to sit and to be and to dwell and to look upon the fullness of the glory of God would have meant death. So God had to reveal himself into ways in which we could manage, almost small bite-sized ways if you want to think of it that way. Yet John writes, the word, God himself, has become flesh and dwelt among us. That God is now dwelling. That, same, that word dwell is the same as that idea of the tabernacle in the Old Testament. So God is no longer sitting in a temple confined there, but he is dwelling in and among us as the word made manifest of God. So that when we look upon Christ, we see the fullness of God. And if when we see Christ, we see the full glory of God, how much more is revealed to us than what was revealed to Moses? Moses got a glance at God's back while he was leaving. Moses got the leftovers of God, right? And yet that was still one of the greatest revelations of God's word. It was him entrusting him with this word. But friends, we don't look upon the leftovers of God. We look upon the fullness of God's glory manifested completely in Jesus. And we don't die, but we get eternal life. For Moses to look upon the fullness of God was death. For us to look upon the fullness of God is the eternal life. It's the work of the word in the world as he functions as a light, as a man who came for us, both fully God and fully man. This is the wonder of the season that in this moment, the light of the world had come, that the God of the universe had come as flesh, dwelling among us, fulfilling one covenant while establishing another eternity, eternally. 
The God of the universe who is all powerful became weak for our sake. The God of the universe who is infinite became finite as a man for our sake. The God who is independent and does not need anyone became dependent on a young woman named Mary as she held him and and fed him and, and, and helped him grow. This is what I love about John's version of the Christmas story, that he cuts through the familiarity of this text. For me, and I don't know if anyone else can resonate with this, but for me, as I hear year after year and read the story year after year, it kind of starts to build this apathy towards this story, that it's just some cute celebration of a baby boy come that would one day be our savior, rather than recognizing it for what it is, that the God of the universe became that which he is not. Understand that God does not have to become. You and I have to become because we are imperfect and incomplete. We are on this sanctification journey. We talk about that a lot. We are on this becoming journey. It's the dirt road of sanctification that we are on. And yet God simply is. And yet even in the midst of that truth, he became that which he was not. And that is flesh out of the love that he had for us that was rooted in his fellowship with the three persons in one and one in three persons. This is what we celebrate in this story. This is the wonder of this season. And I pray that this is um, refreshed and restored to us as we get to look upon the full revelation of God in Jesus. We get to look upon this eschatological end time fulfillment in Jesus that we look at our salvation found solely in Jesus in the form of a baby lying in a manger with animals around him, a star above him, wise men in front of him and a mother comforting him. There is God became flesh dwelling among us revealing himself fully to us so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life, inexhaustible grace, and an unbreakable relationship with him. We get to celebrate that today with, with baptism. We have two wonderful kids who have made that commitment, who have believed, who have taken this new covenant through, made through Jesus, and now they're believing him. So we get to celebrate that in a moment. If, if you are involved with that baptism or need to go pick up your child, you can be dismissed now to do so. But it's something that we have to focus on this wonder of the story that God became flesh, not just in, in this season and four weeks, but something that we should come back to and reorient our minds and to refresh ourselves with every single day of our lives because this shows the heart of a God who cares deeply and who wants to make a way for a people. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this truth God, that you have become that which you are not. God, it spent two weeks preparing for this message and yet that's still not enough time to wrap my head fully around these truths, to wrap my head and to sit fully in the wonder and awe of who you are and what you have done and how you decided to accomplish it. God, we will spend a lifetime pursuing you, attempting to live by your spirit We will spend a lifetime trying to understand the mysteries that you you have revealed to us through your word, both scripture and your son, Jesus. God, we will spend a lifetime being sanctified. And the only reason we believe, the only reason that we can spend a lifetime doing that is because of what you have done through the coming of baby Jesus. So God, we just sit in that truth now. We let that wonder percolate in our souls so that this can restore to us this sense of awe over what you have done and to sit at your throne and to kneel at your throne and just say, thank you. God, that when we get to sit in your presence, the first thing that we recognize is how holy you are and how unholy we are, which then creates this gratitude towards you for what you have done. So God, I pray that by the power of your spirit, you restore this sense of wonder, not just today, not just this week, not just this month, but in our life so that we can follow you with our whole heart, mind, body, strength, and soul. God, we love you. We thank you. As you hear me pray, amen.